James Fox, thanks so much for joining me on the week's well. Yeah, really nice to be here. Thank you, Kim. So I'm really pleased to meet your acquaintance. And as we discussed before we clicked record, we've been at this in our respective yoga universes or um, professional universes for years, but never having overlapped. And so I'm just so glad in the context of the inquiry we are after in this podcast, which is not just to kind of look under the hood of yoga, the lineage of it, lineages of it. I've got just as many post and kind of meta lineage people as the sort of hardcore, like this is my lineage and I'm sticking to it people, you know, because I want practitioners to come in and talk to other practitioners who are mostly this audience, teachers and mindfulness and yoga practitioners about the way that they are transmuting what they're learning inside themselves, what they're discovering, this awareness leading to consciousness that we talked about before I clicked record in the world. And so the reason I've known about you for so many years is this extraordinary work that you do, these books that you've written and this service that you provide that I don't, I can't think of almost anybody else who's a been at it as long as you have and b taught as many people and reached as many people who obviously are in such need of this awareness to consciousness inquiry or practice. So we talked before we clicked record about you beginning with mindfulness as a practice predating yoga. And then you discovering that yoga was this perfect practice leading one to become more aware of one's own body and uncovering, and I'm just sort of inserting things here. I'm sure you'll unpack this more, the traumas that keep you, that hold you suspended from being in your body and and feeling the feelings of having the trauma that brings you to whatever circumstance that you may be meeting people at in your work. So a lot of questions in there, but I think maybe you just start at the beginning and tell us a little bit about where you were and how you've gotten here. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Kim. Um, Yes, we were talking about, I I like the term mindful awareness. It seems to be a little more descriptive for me in terms of um, that fundamental shift that takes place in a person's life from moving out of, of kind of an automatic state of not really being fully aware you know we in in yoga we use the word presence all the time presence well what we're really talking about is honing that state of mindful awareness so that you can shift into this state of awareness and so i was originally introduced to that through mindfulness practices my first teacher was stephen levine um stephen and andrea his wife uh, in the early 80s. And then by the time I started practicing yoga, which was in 1987, I realized quickly, and I originally started practicing yoga because I had an injury in my back from running. I immediately felt, oh, this is mindfulness in motion. This is mindful awareness in motion. So that when you're practicing for an hour or an hour and a half, you're taking this deep dive into combining the mind and the body in this state of moment to moment awareness. And um, and, and that was really beneficial for me in terms of my own healing. I mean, I really became uh, dedicated to yoga because I felt the healing benefits of the practice. And as I was mentioning to you, I kind of took the physical healing as the icing on the cake, but the greater part of the healing was emotional healing and really, and really kind of gaining emotional literacy from practicing yoga. And the way that I relate that and the way that I talk about it in my work is that when you practice yoga as part of practicing yoga and really becoming dedicated to practicing, there's a greater sense of sensitivity to oneself. You become, as a a result of practicing yoga, you become more sensitive to yourself. You become in greater touch with yourself. You become 
you're you're more able to define, you know, okay, what is it that I'm feeling in my body? What is it that I'm feeling in my heart? And so that that builds a certain level of emotional literacy. And for our work, that's really important in working with people that turns into empathy. And empathy is a major move in terms of people who've caused harm becoming responsible and taking accountability for the harm that they caused. And until they reach that point, until they kind of step into, oh my God, the amount of harm I've caused myself in making that deep connection with self, not just bodily, but emotionally, and then realizing, ah, oh, what about the harm I've caused other people? The, the, the survivors of the kinds of harms that I've caused. And in terms of the whole restorative justice model, which I've been a part of over the last 20 years, that's key. Addressing harm caused. Addressing the harm caused victims and survivors of, of crime and addressing the harm that was caused by the perpetrators of the harm. Mm -hmm. And so yoga's piece in that is developing this state of greater consciousness, this state of greater mindful awareness, so that there's a deeper dive into self-understanding, self-sensitivity that can turn into the, the greater empathy that can lead to, because without that, there's a danger of recommitting harm once one leaves. So that that that's like a fundamental change in really in in rehabilitation, mm -hmm. um, which our system is greatly lacking because mm -hmm. our system is so much focused on punishment. Mm -hmm. um, it is beginning to change. I know I'm going in a lot of different directions. No, it's great. going a lot into the soup here, into the yeah. stew, but. Um, so what I learned early on, first of all, from my own experience of like, okay, yes, I can do most of the asana practices because I'm physically fit and everything, but the deep, deeper reward for me of practicing yoga was that state of mindful awareness that spread out into my world, that yeah. spread out into my relationships, relationships, it spread out into my working life, it spread out into my relationship with myself and being able to have insight into, hmm, where did I, where did I lose that state of awareness? Because I certainly came into the world with that state of awareness. Where did I lose that state of awareness, conditioning and so on and so forth? And now I'm regaining it. Now I'm regaining it. So, I learned early on when I first started practicing, I did have some mis, um, misperceptions in that, you know, I'm going into a relatively high level prison, you know, providing a yoga class to men who voluntarily come to the class. So I remember in the beginning, I thought, well, I better make it worth their while physically. Mm. But it was very shortly, just a few months after I had been uh, teaching, and I was teaching primarily life sentence men with the possibility of parole. So there were men who had already done a long period of time in prison, and the only way they were going to get out was from parole. And I remember one of the guys came to class that evening, and he walked in and he said, hey, James, you're going to kick our ass tonight? And I went, wait a minute, wait a minute. Mm. Is that what I've been doing? Is that the message that I've been getting across? Mm. And so I made a very fundamental change mm -hmm. in that moment and said, my focus needs to be more on developing a deep state of mindful awareness, slowing things down, really being able to provide a practice that touches on all the eight limbs of yoga and being able to balance that out so that the participants in the program could have a really full understanding of what, as our friend Satbir Khalsa talks about, 
what classical yoga is all about Mm because classical yoga follows the eight limbs it's raja yoga it follows Mm -hmm. the eight limbs of yoga so if i'm not incorporating into my teaching Mm -hmm. pratyahara dharana dhyana uh and of course pranayama and 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 asana practice Mm -hmm. and then of course yamas and niyamas are particularly important in the work Mm -hmm. that we do Mm -hmm. And being able to communicate those limbs in a very practical, secular way. Because that's another one of the things that we're up against in that we'd lose people if we start slipping into Sanskrit and start yeah. using too much yoga philosophy. We have Muslims and we have uh, Rastafarians and we have Native Americans and we have all different kinds of people from different traditions who are coming to our class. So, um, so as a result of that, when I wrote my book, Yoga Path for Healing and Recovery, I did that with the intention of really a very, very in-depth approach in a short, you know, hundred page booklet uh, of what classical yoga was really all about. And, and your goal, there's so many questions I want to ask, but your goal for the book was to get it into as many hand, incarcerated hands as possible, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And so I guess there's two kind of methodological things I'm interested in. And you've sort of answered the first one, which is it seems like your methodology is through these eight, you know, precepts, you know, five restraints and five observances, and then how to express those in the body and then into the breath and then into the consciousness. And I would imagine, and I guess I'll just stay with this question here first, that a non-harming or ahimsa, and let's call it non-harming to honor who we're talking about, forget the Sanskrit. So non-harming um, is the core, is it? It is, it is. And of course, from a, and, and here's where the connection to restorative justice comes in, which is. And that was my second question. Yeah. So perfect. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, restorative justice is all about two words, harm cost, addressing harm cost. And so you can see how ahimsa fits into that. And it's introduced. It's not like you know, we're pounding away, we're pounding away at ahimsa. It's introduced as an understanding and it's also introduced as an understanding of whatever tradition you come from, Mm -hmm. heard this before. So it's not like this is new to you. And our job isn't because people who are incarcerated, first of all, people who are incarcerated are treated day in and day out, 24 hours a day, as the person who committed the crime that they committed that brought them to prison. Mm -hmm. And so there's this constant suppression of any kind of goodness, any kind other than the fact that they committed a crime and that they caused harm. There's, they're constantly reminded of this Mm -hmm. by the fact that they're being punished by the fact, by the way that they're being treated while they're incarcerated A lot of the cognitive behavioral, although it's very important work, a lot of the cognitive behavioral programs that are run in prison are to develop insight into how did you become the kind of person who caused the harm that you caused? Okay, so you go through a course, it's a year long course and week in and week out, it's like, oh, so you, of course it's important to review that and to gain that understanding but it's not our job to pile on top of that. It's to, it's to understand these are the core precepts of yoga. This is how we carry those forward in the practice that we do. Mm-hmm. And really, we kind of come back to, we can take the, the six other limbs. And again, I'll refer to Satpir Khalsa because he's shown this diagram, diagram that there's four major components yeah. to to traditional yoga, to classical yoga. There's what I call mindful awareness rather than meditation. There's mindful awareness, there's conscious breathing, there's movement, and there's deep relaxation. So when I introduce the yoga practice to a new group of of participants in my program, 
I'll talk, I'll say this is, yoga means union. That's what it means. The union of what? And somebody always yells out, mind, body, spirit. And what I typically say is, I can speak to mind, body, but I can't speak to spirit because that's your business. Mm. What I can speak to is that it's the union of mind, heart, and body. Mental, emotional, and physical aspects of ourselves. And there's plenty of research on this. So I can speak with a fair amount of support that there's research about this. Most of us are disconnected from this connection of mental, emotional, and physical. We're mostly mental. And, you know, then when it comes to emotional, particularly in working with men and particularly in working with men who've caused harm, there's not a lot of emotional intelligence there. And then when you start to talk about sensations in the body, that's all new territory. So what we're attempting to do week in and week out, week in and week out, is to demonstrate that balance through the practices that we do of mental, emotional, and physical well-being. So that at the end of the class, they can go, I feel it, I feel it. And of course, that takes time. Um, and then of course, then they go back out into the prison environment too. And you know, we're we're only teaching once a week because we're limited in, in terms of classroom space. And the other thing I decided years ago was I'd rather have. We have four classes a week at San Quentin. We have classes in we have classes in six other California state prisons. We have classes in California jails. We have we have programs in 15 other states. We have programs in Mexico. We have programs in five European countries. We have programs in Australia. And all of these are as a result of training teachers in our trauma-informed mindfulness-based methodology. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying to you is all part of our teacher training mm -hmm. that and 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 relating this to a trauma informed so there's a deep dive into understanding trauma there's a deep dive into studying the work of Bessel van der Kolk Stephen Porges uh, Peter Levine um, Gabor Mate uh, so really in order to do this work effectively, particularly when you move into trauma informed, you really need to study behavioral and somatic psychology to, to have to really understand, OK, why am I here? What, what's the purpose of me being here? And the real purpose of our if, if we're talking to the system, if we're talking to the prison systems, our piece is we have an important piece in the rehabilitation of incarcerated people. That's our greatest contribution to what it is you should be doing. We'll say what, whatever it is that you are doing, but it really is whatever it is you should be doing, this is our piece. We contribute to uh, rehabilitation of the personal transformation, the, the, the character transformation of an individual while they're incarcerated. Because typically we have somebody for at least a year in our program. And, um, and they actually get credit for, in California, they get credit for coming to our classes. For what, uh, to what? Uh, I'm off, uh -huh. I'm off. Uh -huh. And it, 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 there's a cap on it, but they still get credit. So there's meaning there. And people say, well, they probably come to class because you know, they're getting credit and you know, what else are they gonna do? <laughs> No, no, because yeah, I have a hard time with that. Actually, yeah. why would somebody say that? Because they think because of their perception of yoga, Ugh. which is what because that it's that it's like facile and silly they, and people who don't understand yoga and the tradition of yoga look at yoga as the the magazine ad that they yeah. saw Ugh, I, yeah. of a pretty woman in beautiful clothing with a candle lit in the background in some kind of meditation pose. And they think that's what yoga is. Yeah. Which is, you, one, yeah. It's, it's like, ah, totally. I just, I just, just came across my, 
phone yesterday, the, the wellness, I have to look it up. I mean, I'll just pause, <laughs> um, uh, pause the, pause the tape so that people don't have to listen, to listen to me search it. the wellness trap. Have you heard of that book? No. Uh-uh. So I, you know, I went, you know, my own deep dive into, you know, uh, Goodreads just to, re- I always like to like, if I'm interested in the book, I read, like I spend 45 minutes on the reviews. Cause I want to see what the, like you know, the one star people say, what the three star, four star, five. And it's a, my best friend sent it to me. And I said, you know, who do you think the audience is for this? We were just talking back and forth over whether or not I'm going to spend the time to read. And she said, the people that have been snookered by goop, you know, by Gwyneth Paltrow's whole thing. And I know, I don't mean to conflate. I know wellness is not yoga. Yoga is not wellness, but they sit very close to one another. And you probably at this point would put yoga inside the wellness kind of like, you know, industry. And it, it just, um, it, it, it troubles me so much that Mm -hmm. that is what people think wellness and yoga are. Mm -hmm. And so maybe I'll have to delete all this out because I don't mean to to take it off, but it's just, it, 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 um, it's really depressing to me (laughs) that we've, that we're here, that, that the consumerism, the consumer, the consumerism of yoga has turned it into this thing that you sort of swipe through and check off and don't allow as Sapir says to speak of him again, you don't allow it to like blow your mind. You don't allow it to really touch these deep parts of you so that you understand so much more profoundly how you in your, and here we go with another, you know, Sanskrit, but you know, you and your Dharma, how you fit into the rest of the world. And it strikes me just talking to you that you knew that this is where you fit like early on. Right. Yeah. Well, when I first started and, and, and decided that I wanted to teach, I was really clear. I, I, I'm not interested in teaching in a yoga studio. Mm-hmm. I want to teach to people. I want to expose people who aren't exposed to yoga. Right. And so I originally right. worked with uh, young men at risk mm-hmm. who were in residential treatment. And then that led to doing some work in juvenile halls in the Bay area. Mm-hmm. Toughest work I've ever done, I might add. And um, and then that led two years later to being asked in 2002 to bring the yoga program into San Quentin. Mm -hmm. And I really. My original impulse was I would like young men, particularly young men at risk and dealing with greater difficulties than I dealt with when I was a young man. Although I, I mean, you know, I grew up in Chicago and had a lot of exposure to inner city kinds of youth sort of basically violence, mm-hmm. bottom line, mm-hmm. of what, what when I ended up at one point in time, I became certified as a, uh, a violence prevention facilitator. And I, I used to teach violence prevention at San Quentin also. And in the, in the training that I did, one of the main things that we really dove into what was called the male role belief system. Meaning, how do you think and how do you act like a man? And if you don't think and act like a man, you're a wuss or worse than that. You know, other words, worse than that. I grew up with that understanding. Like I was totally immersed in the male role belief system. Mm -hmm. And the male role belief system leads to suffering. It leads to personal suffering and it leads to the suffering of others because you basically take on the male role belief system takes on, well, if you need to be in control, number one, and to be in control, if you need to be aggressive, you're aggressive. Well, look at our culture. Look at some of the leaders of our country yeah. and, the, and, and the message that they put out around being aggressive and taking advantage of people. And if you, you, and if you need to use might, you need, you, you need to use might. Yoga is completely opposite of that. And I felt particularly in working with the body and working with the mind, that there was a way into working with young men, have a different experience of what it feels like to be a man and what it feels like to be a strong man. Mm -hmm. 
And so that was my impulse to originally start to teach. And then it led me to San Quentin. And the next thing I knew, it kind of found me because when I first started teaching at San Quentin, it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to set up the prison yoga project as a nonprofit and train teachers all over the world and everything. I had no idea. I was just basically going in and, and the first six, seven years, I was like a sponge. I was just learning and being around all these men who came from all these different backgrounds and the common denominator of all of them was violence and addiction. Yeah. Yeah. So my challenge was how can I take a yoga practice if I'm if my mandate is is to is to support rehabilitation how can I sculpt a yoga practice to address these issues mm -hmm. violence and addiction both of which come from what I've now learned these years later childhood trauma totally 100 percent it's all a result of childhood trauma totally which, which yeah. comes from, you know, epigenetic, you know, influences, right? The people. Transgenerational needed, trauma. Right. Yeah. Right. Epigenetics, right. Uh, community, community trauma, community influence. And certainly, uh, you know, structural and yeah. institutional. <laughs> yeah. All of it. And then, and then Kim, to see the moment when, the men wake up when the light goes off. It, it's, it is the most beautiful. This is where, you know, people will say, oh, you're so lucky that, 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 that those incarcerated people are so lucky that they have yoga. And it's like, they're lucky. <laughs> right. Do you know what I get out of this? Totally. You know, in terms of witnessing, um, the awakening and and sharing i mean it's the sharing it's the community it's the true sangha once again and this goes back to it at least in my mind what yoga is really all about mm -hmm. yeah you know and i was gonna i want to get back to that question about the year i i feel like i derailed the conversation a little bit because i was having such an allergic reaction to whoever says to you like <laughs> yoga, you know, and, and so you talked about the year that it, that it, you're typically with these guys, and the changes that you witness. And in, in, in I may <clears throat> excuse me, not have been really listening that actively because I was thinking to myself, you know, 45, 50 weeks is a lot. Mm -hmm. And and what I also am am wondering, just want to put a pin in, is this contrast that that time you spend with them provides because it's about, if I'm understanding correctly and certainly just projecting my own experience in yoga, it's about them experiencing presence, like their own presence, which etymologically is so cool because it's in the present and it's not about the past. It's not about like you, you, are, you are teaching them in that moment in these, you know, the mental, emotional, and physical layers of their bodies and whatever it is that you're teaching, I'm assuming they move some, yeah, but it sure. sounds like they're, you're also doing quite a bit of just sort of still witnessing because back to Sapir's thing, you're probably doing the four. I mean, you're doing mindful awareness, you're doing right, uh, you know, conscious breathing, you're doing deep relaxation, you're doing, um, uh, movement, I guess. Yeah. Movement. Sorry. Yeah. I was thinking, with mindful awareness, sometimes in my mind, I think, well, that's also movement, but you're doing all four of those. Right. And so, yeah. so I guess my question is, does it typically such a dumb question actually, does it take a year, but you know, what do you see in the course of a year kind of generally, you probably can't generalize, but slash, and is it also possible to thread in the learnings that you absorbed when you were working with these young men at risk and connecting those two, because you're teaching men who were once young men at risk and came from these same common denominators of, you know, abuse and violence of substance abuse and violence. So can we talk a little bit about 
the transformations or the sort of the actual methodology, the work that you see, what triggers, what doesn't, what yeah. down regulates, what doesn't. Yeah. So to begin with, most of these men are stuck in that, in that adolescent juvenile stage of development, particularly, definitely emotionally. And, 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 you know, the impact of trauma basically has accumulated to that point when they were teenagers and they started making decisions at that time to use drugs, to commit crimes, so on and so forth, that led to, that, that led to more crimes and led to more, you know, harmful behavior. So there's kind of an understanding that the vast majority of them are stuck back in that that arrested development. No, no pun intended. Um, and and in terms of if you were to come and if you were to come and observe the, if you were to come, nobody observes the class. Anybody who comes, a teacher who comes, practices with us, you would pretty much say, well, this is kind of like a regular yoga practice, a yoga class, because we're moving. Um, we, we're doing more, we're doing more periods of, of, of non-active mindful awareness, whether it's seated, whether it's standing, so that we're modulating because a major part a major part of dealing with trauma is to learning how to modulate the autonomic nervous system from moving from autonomic nervous system, uh, moving from autonomic to, to uh, parasympathetic nervous system. And basically what we compare it to is accelerator to brake. Well, mo most men who are in prison, they've only known accelerator. And to hit the brake meant, you know, take a drug, drink. So, what we're learning through our movements as we go through our asana practice, our movement practice is moving from sympathetic and sun salutations, for instance, moving from sympathetic and then very unexpectedly stopping. And you'll see a lot of the photos from the prison yoga project with one hand on the chest and the other on the stomach to take a few moments of mindful breathing of feeling the movement in the body as you breathe and being still so that we're, and, and uh, the other thing is, by the way, this directly supports impulse control. So, totally. you know, you're learning self-regulation by doing this. So it's not, let's do a yoga class and get into an asana practice and just boom, 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 which you would think you know, like I originally thought that's what right. I want. Yeah. What is really important is to learn this self-modulation and to understand th the first time they've ever heard about the autonomic nervous system is usually in the yoga class and, and autonomic nervous system and understanding your autonomic nervous system is pretty much stuck on, on while you're incarcerated because you're being bombarded all the time by the influence of being in this environment, not to mention the environment that you came from. So how do you engage your, your relaxation response of your body? Well, that's something that we're going to do when we practice. It's not that, of course, we need our autonomic nervous system. We need the accelerator. We also need to learn how to brake. And in learning how to brake, it's going to help you in dealing with triggers in confrontation because people are conf confronted all the time while they're incarcerated. They're confronted with staff because by the way that they're treated, they're, conf they're confronted with other incarcerated people, you know, whose lack of awareness and consciousness is minimal. It's an ongoing, you know, one of the, one of the difficulties of being in that environment day in and day out. Um, so learning the ability to modulate is super important. So we do it through movement, we do it through breathing, we do it through, through deep relaxation, all supported by mindful awareness. Because mindful awareness is the first step in, right? It's like, okay, 
one of my things that I like to say when we start a class is I invite you to take this opportunity to leave prison, to leave the world outside this room behind you. I'm doing the same thing. I'm leaving the world, my world outside of this room, I'm leaving to engage with you in this process of mindful awareness and potential healing with one another. And we're doing that. So building community is this another really important part of recovering from trauma is building community. So we've got this incredible opportunity, particularly in an environment like that, that, you know, there's not a lot of safe communities to be in, in a, in a prison. So you're creating a very safe place for people to come together to trust and work with one another in this healing process. And we all, including myself, we're all taking part in this journey. Yeah. And I'm, it's something comes to mind about, so yes to the community. I, I hadn't unpacked that part in my mind as much, but it reminds me first of this, you know, the first commentary on the sutras I read was Swami Satchinananda's because my first training was integral yoga, like a long time ago, right after 9-11, actually a trauma that I had because I, <laughs> Because of trauma, because of my own childhood trauma, I wound up on Wall Street because I wanted a one way, like independent woman road out of my childhood I, and haven't gone back, you know, because I, and I thought to myself, the only way I'm going to do this is if I make a ton of money, which seemed reasonable, <laughs> you know, at the time, but then 9-11 occurred and I was like, what am I doing with, uh, and I lost a friend that day. I mean, it was, and I was depressed. I mean, I just, you know, I hated, I just didn't square with my values. I mean, here I am now talking to you. So obviously I wasn't meant for that life, I guess. But anyway, um, I guess my question is that soon after I'm a t I've been taking yoga for years and years. And so read Swami Satchinananda's translation of the sutras. And he talks in one, in the first chapter, the first pada, about the, how the mind can create, does create the experience of being in, a, in prison. He has a, a whole page, five, six pages of, I can't remember which sutra exactly. And I remember reading that and thinking, oh, I just, is that in sense, is that, is that appropriate? I mean, I just, I really had, a, had trouble with it because I thought, how could you project that onto people who are actually incarcerated. And my question, I have it written in my notes from 20 years ago, like, is it possible for someone incarcerated to really in their own mind, leave prison? And so 20 years later, you've answered that question for me. The answer yeah. is they can through the community yeah. and this multimodal approach to mindful, to yoga, mindful awareness, conscious breathing, you know, deep relaxation and, and movement. And so I guess my next question is, or I guess my fundamental question is, do you think ever about whether this is the first time that some of these people have ever felt safe? I mean, I wonder if they ever felt safe in their lives. Is that too uh, big a I, question? Maybe that's just- No, no I don't one. think it's too big of a question. I think- I think, although I don't do that kind of work in terms of um, taking people into the subconscious or even in yoga nidra, you know, finding a, mm -hmm. finding a, you know, your, your safe space. I, I, I don't, I, I do more of a body scan in yoga nidra when I use yoga nidra. Um, I would say most people who are incarcerated have had that <clears throat> one safe relationship mm. with men. It's almost always a grandmother or a mother or some kind of female character in their life mm. that they felt they were loved and they were accepted. Mm -hmm. Very rare that it was a man, mm -hmm. very rare that it was a man. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that being in the yoga class is one of the few places while they're in the prison mm -hmm. that they feel really safe. Mm 
Mm. And of course, I'm responsible for creating a safe space that they can come into and then treating them in a way that they feel safe and that they can trust me. That's so huge, you know, and it's so huge for any yoga teacher to establish trust. And, you know, one of the biggest issues that I had when I was practicing yoga as a student and studying that, you know, when that trust was broken because no, 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 you need to do this. You need to, you need to be in a headstand for five minutes. So you need to be, I don't, you know, what do you mean your shoulder stand, you know, stay in the shoulder stand, you know, it's like, whoa, whoa, yeah, but my body is saying this doesn't feel right. So <clears throat> it's a safe place for people. I, I know a number of, a number of the men say to me, this is absolutely my favorite time of the week. This hour and a half, our classes are, are an hour and a half, they're 90 minutes. I'm so glad. And, and, you know, we really, and, and we're really fortunate, particularly the class that I teach um, of the four different classes at the prison, the four different groups, is at the end of the, of the San Quentin yard. We're kind of, and we're next to the Native American spiritual grounds where the sweat lodge is. So we get all this great energy coming off of, you know, it's, it doesn't mean a sweat lodge is going on, although there was one last week when we, when I taught last week, but we're kind of out of the mainstream of the prison and we've got this space to ourselves and we're never bothered by guards or anything like that. It's just, it's just us. So that's ideal, you know, in terms of creating that space. But this is also, by the way, this is a really, really important part of our training of teachers You've never been in a prison before. You, you, you know, how do you create that safe space? How do you carry yourself? What do you have to work on yourself to really feel, I feel safe. I feel uh, centered when I go into the, this environment. Um, most of our teachers are women mm -hmm. because most yoga teachers are women. Mm -hmm. um, but this is, you know, this is another focus that we have in our teacher training is like really preparing people to go into an environment that's very foreign to, al to almost anybody unless they've been incarcerated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And, and do you, how does one, how, how much time do you spend on that? How do you get people to that place where they know they can feel safe because that is a that's a hell of a space to hold and i just want to name or say like amplify whatever that the levelizing that you described you do like i'm gonna go with you i'm gonna leave this prison also in my mind we're gonna do this together mm -hmm. which I, I, i'm maybe instinctively some yoga teachers do but i don't know that all of them do the recognition that it's just a oh, i mean it's just a, a random slice of the universe that yeah. puts you there and them right. where they are. Yeah. It's just, it, it's nothing. It, you it's know? What, and, and it's also why we call ourselves facilitators rather than yeah. teachers to, to basically, you know, level the playing field. I love it. Yeah. We, we're, we facilitate a process that everybody takes, takes part in and everybody benefits from it. There's no teacher and student. Um, Did you know that from the beginning? Were you, were you, did you know that like, I mean, you know, instinctively I knew that yeah. I visit guy from yeah. growing up in Chicago, you know, I need to enter into this with, you know, not <clears throat> and kind of deflect that, uh, you know, Oh, you're the teacher. You're the, you know, kind of deflect that and go, no, I'm, I'm, I'm here with you and we're doing this. <clears throat> it's really about Sangha. It's, it's really about we're here together for the purpose, and this is something else that I say, we're here together for the primary purpose of supporting each other in our highest good. I want you to support me in my highest good, and I guarantee you I'm going to support you in your highest good. Oh, my gosh. What an unbelievable opportunity to spend 90 minutes a week together with that as the intention. 
And if I'm really sincere about that, and if I really can see people, which is a challenge sometimes, because when I find out sometimes why certain people are in there, it's hard for me to basically see them <laughs> in a state of their highest good, like, whoa. But uh, nonetheless, I don't want to get sidetracked with that. There's a sincerity about meeting people with unconditional um, regard for you can attain your state of highest good. You, you, and, you know, in shifting into yoga philosophy, I can see the divine in you. I don't know if you can see it in yourself. I'm not going to speak with somebody that way. But if I'm, a, if I'm really dedicated and I'm really committed to what it is that I'm talking about, then it is my job to create the time together to draw out the divine, one's highest good, one's authentic self. And, and that's where that awakening takes place. That's where the light bulb goes off and goes, oh, that awakening takes place. And you can just imagine how that shifts consciousness away from causing harm into who knows what yeah, yeah whatever yeah. direction that they yeah right and i don't mean to put words in maybe i don't know you maybe you were going to say something else you had asked me a question about you know in terms of my experience of the process mm -hmm. i pretty much see it takes six months of mm -hmm. regular week in and week out process mm -hmm. week in and week out practicing together at around six months and I'm, I'm very consistent. I don't change the practice. I have two or three different practices. I do a back pain practice because back pain and sciatica are epidemic in prison. They're epidemic in society. Mm -hmm. But probably every fifth class, I'll do the back pain practice. And, and then I've got a couple of other standard practices. And I want to do those practices so that they learn, okay, by the sixth month, they go, oh, I know where he's going with this. I don't have to think a lot about where I'm going to put my feet or what, what, what pose I'm going to go into, but reinforcing over and over and over again of staying with mindful awareness, staying with the breath, being able to modulate accelerator break, and then taking the time for deep relaxation mm -hmm. and not having to wait just for Shavasana for that being able to interject in the practice moments of coming back to oneself because that's where he, he, him that's where the that's where the pause that everybody every whether you're incarcerated or not i mean look at society totally i mean if we could just learn how to create those moments of pause in our life mm -hmm to kind of reset the nervous system, to, to basically have a habit of being able to every day have those moments to, I'm, I'm, I'm stressing, I'm, 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 I'm flipping out, you know, reset the nervous system. I've got this practice, I can reset my nervous system in five minutes mm -hmm. by sitting in my car before I jump out and go into the grocery store. Totally. You know, and yeah. Yeah, I I was just I, it's so interesting listening to you describe it that way and to connect it or thread it back to that sangha piece that community piece because one of the things is you know I've been in this industry not as long as you have and and you know I've worked with a lot of different populations parents for example with children with just profound um, disabilities um, mm -hmm. many of whom died in you know early childhood and um, people with disabilities has been been a thing that I've worked on partly in my career so I'm just sort of thinking about how as I've looked at the way that mindfulness and yoga has expanded you know in the last 20 years, and there's an app for it. There, there's an app for that. There's a this, there's a that. You can log in, you can log out. You can do it alone in your own room and reset your nervous system, let's say. But in, in COVID, you know, I think a lot of us did that. And 
I myself having moved to Denver just a couple of years ago and doing almost all of my work online have had a little bit of like extended COVID. It's been a real struggle for me to, I haven't found a yoga community here. It's been two years. I haven't found a place to go do these things that you're describing. Um, and, and that I know so well. So I've done a lot of it alone and in doing it alone, it's become not only less effective for me inside myself, but also turned in onto itself, like become scary and turned up a lot of my old traumas of isolation and feeling, you know, abused <laughs> you know, and neglected and abused, you know, as a child. So all these things have kind of come up and it just makes me realize that what you're describing about this resetting of the nervous system is not only so profound because it's so important that it happens, but that you are learning it. You've learned it and you're teaching it and talking about it in the context of a community of people who possibly need it the very most, yeah, I guess so. right? I mean, because it's, it's in some respects, the very society that we're describing that's so aggro and so tense on the edges that really sensitive people feel themselves. And sometimes I think about people that do, do commit crimes like this, violent crimes or other crimes that, that there, there may be part of them. First of all, they had, again, I I'm, 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 I'm making things up and I just want to be clear. No, no, I don't, no. but, but people absorb stress yeah. and anxiety and rage and in mm -hmm. so many different parts of their nervous system and never learn how to reset and always feel that they're alone in those feelings. So I just want a really long-winded way of connecting what you're saying back to that community that in yoga writ large, I think we're trying to create. And then again, I can't say it any other way. You're doing so profoundly in your work. Yeah. Well, yeah. And it's so critical in terms of the <clears throat> healing of trauma, because the, most people who've experienced um, trauma and it's unresolved, isolation is a big thing. You know, mm -hmm. it's like shame, isolation. Yeah. Um, and the healing, that's why group work is so, so powerful. And the, the group work that I, I miss doing the group work that I used to do in prison, um, where, you know, the, you, you, you know, you're not moving and you're not doing yoga, you're chopping it up. You're, yeah. you're taking deep dives into, and the, and, and you're creating community. That's what group work is that, that, that you, you're not doing anymore? Sorry. Um, the violence prevention. Work. Oh, the violence prevention. So okay. Yeah. What the organization that originally invited me, the restorative justice organization that I see me in was called the insight prison project. Mm. It had its origin at spirit rock meditation mm -hmm. center. Yeah. And then I became a, a violence prevention facilitator. And I also became what's called victim offender education mm. facilitator. And so you'd have, you'd be, you'd have a group for a year. You'd have 12 or 15 men and you went deep, 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 deep into uh, develop, which completely informed my yoga practice. Yeah. Right. That, okay. Th th in reality, this, here's where they're coming from. This is what they're dealing with. So in terms of providing yoga as a therapeutic practice, mm -hmm. as a therapeutic practice, understanding what the need is mm -hmm. in terms of their healing is critically important. So, um, and then that the, the whole thing about community is just, it's just super important. Yeah. And I just thinking, you know, to be you know, respectful and conscious of your time and, and to, and to, <laughs> and at the same time to look at these other books that you've written for these other communities who've experienced trauma, women and veterans and, you know, other work you're doing. And I, I, uh, I wish we had, you know, so much more time to talk about it, maybe part two or something. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about any, um, you know, contours of those books that are, that you've learned in your work? 
or in teaching teachers to teach them as well that are different or that the audience might uh, be able to walk away from and think about in terms of, you know, yoga for women in prison or yoga for veterans? Yeah, I think, I think that the original book, which I have, uh, I, I uh, did the, I, I edited it and revised it in during 2020, during COVID. Hmm. So the current um, edition of it, Yoga Path for Healing and Recovery, which you can find on our website, um, it goes into a number of the things that I talk about because, mm -hmm. we, by the way, we've sent 38,000 copies of it to exactly. incarcerated people who've written us and asked for a copy since 2010. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so I wanted to give as broad a uh, introduction to yoga following the, you know, the eight limbs as possible. So I think I think yoga teachers would find, wow, this is a very concise, abbreviated introduction mm -hmm. to yoga. However, there's a lot of trauma-informed in information in there. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of nervous system information in there. Um, so I think, it, I think it's practical in that regard. The woman's book who I wrote with our European program director, Josephine Wickstrom, who- Oh uh, yeah, I met her yeah, recently. Yeah. She's, she's great. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> she's taught in a women's prison in Sweden for many years. She also mm -hmm. teaches in a high security men's prison in Sweden. Mm -hmm. And she and I, and she's the major author of that. I co-authored that book with her. That is a phenomenal book for women because it goes into so many different issues around hormones, around mm -hmm. an, a, a, other kinds of you know, emotional considerations of working with women. And, you know, here you have women who are incarcerated, who you put in a cauldron of, mm -hmm. of, of being confined and then having to deal with <clears throat> hormonal issues, emotional issues, separation from their children. And she really has her finger on the pulse of bringing, bringing healing practices for women. Amazing. So that, that book is phenomenal. Okay. Um, and my contribution to the best practices for working with veterans. I mean, I'm one of the contributors to that. That's a really good book. Mm -hmm. um, and when I decided, actually, Rob Schwer and I went and did this, this training of working with veterans. And I was really interested at the time. This was a long time ago. Um, and I, I was really intrigued by, okay. <clears throat> How different is it to be working with combat veterans who are coming back from active combat and working with gangbangers? Mm -hmm. Because the mindset is, you know, with combat veterans, and I have a lot of respect for them, the mindset is, I've got a mission to do, forget about the emotional connection. I've got a job to do, I've got to do the job. So there's a, there, there's a result of that that they call moral injury, which you're probably uh, aware of, mm -hmm. that, okay, now you're done with your combat and you come back and it's like, and then you reflect on certain things that you had to do as part of the mission that you wouldn't have done otherwise. Mm -hmm. Gangbangers, people who've caused harm. I was part of a gang. I had to basically connect. I, I had to collect the debt. I had to do what I had to do. And now mm -hmm. I'm incarcerated. I've done 15 years and I'm having, and if you're asking me to go into my heart and feel what it is that I feel and take responsibility. So mm. I was intrigued with that. And then I realized as a result of that, there are a lot of parallels. Yeah. And what I ended up doing was starting a class for veterans at San Quentin wow. and trained two veterans who basically led those classes. And then the classes stopped in COVID because my, my facilitators aren't available anymore. Yeah. I would love to, in the next talk, maybe we can talk a little bit about how uh, things have changed from COVID, but I'd love to leave it there and just keep my fingers crossed that, you're keeping on, keeping on James, because what oh, you're doing is Thank such so amazing work. I just, I have just such, such respect for it and anything that this podcast do, or I can do to support you. 
I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about it. Oh, thank you so much for spending the time with me.